Hello. Welcome. Oh, this is a really good crowd. I was looking at 77 attendees the last time I saw, and this is a really good turnout. So hello, everybody. My name is Natasha. I'm from Women Dance SG. Uh, I like to call myself a sister group of Junior Dance SG, if I may, Michael. But uh, basically, we're also another uh, tech community. Uh, Singapore is full of like uh, tech community groups like these. Uh, we do similar events like Junior Dance uh, SG. Uh, but we try to like achieve more representation of women just to like bump those numbers up. Uh, but it's open to both women and uh, men. But uh, I, I'll have links later that you can see. Uh, but today I am doing quite a uh, highly requested uh, topic. I was kind of like uh, bumbling on this topic for a while uh, because I know like a lot of like the work technical workshops that you go to and the events that you go to in a tech community uh, usually are more technical in nature. Uh, but I think like uh, in my stint uh, volunteering for the tech community, uh, what I've noticed is that uh, as techies, while we have a lot of resources out there to learn, a lot of the hard skills, uh, we do lack a little bit of the soft skills that are even more in demand in industry right now. And one of the questions I ask a lot, I uh, get asked a lot, especially as the partnerships meet for Women Devs SG is, how do I network? Um, and I was just thinking about it. It's actually quite hard to distill it down to the logic of it. Uh, so this is my first time, and I'm trying to use a lot of parallel concepts to match it to the engineering mindset. So please bear with me some of the analogies that are kind of cliche that I tried. Okay, so networking. I am not talking about network engineering. If that is what you're here for, uh, I apologize. We can talk about network engineering like after this as an aside, but... Um, we're talking about the one that's closer to social engineering. So I think like first I wanna cover the why networking uh, would be important for techies, uh, be it your engineer, DevOps engineer, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think like really there are, in the tech industry, especially nowadays, uh, the landscape is really changing very rapidly. It used to be an option, like I guess years ago, uh, but currently it's no longer an optional extra. Job market is getting pretty volatile. You know, things are really changing pretty rapidly. Industry knowledge is just like uh, a lot of it is very tested and stuck with individuals, and you need to reach out to people to learn. So, with networking, what you get is one career growth. You're going to be stuck at an L1, L2 engineer like forever if you don't like reach out beyond your comfort zones to gain those skills and knowledge that's needed in industry. And oftentimes, like especially um, if you think you can be an IC, a true individual contributor your whole life, well, that doesn't happen. Okay, like you still have to work with people. So definitely one like career growth. A uh, second is hidden job markets, and uh, this is the one I kind of want to expand on. I was just talking with this group just now because like I have an upcoming event with Women Devs that's a lot about tech recruitment actually, and um, it was quite interesting because uh, when I talk to people who are recruiting. They tell me that it's so hard to find job opportunities. But when I go back into the tech industry, people are telling me, where do I find these people to hire? So I see like a mismatch in that. And I think a lot of it is in hidden job markets. You know, if we're often like just online looking for these job opportunities, we see the things that are sponsored on LinkedIn. And you know, you have like hundreds of thousands of applicants going for those jobs. But what about like the other job markets that you aren't looking at? Because tech is so pervasive now. Every other bugger in the industry wants an in-house development team. So why aren't you looking at that? And that's what you can get through networking. Uh, the next one is obviously industry knowledge. Our industry just moves like so fast. And every day, you know, you have a new thing in AI, you have a new thing in cybersecurity, you have a new thing in uh, DevOps it's going to be very hard for you to keep track of them um, if you're basically just going to stay at home and then like code all day. But it's really easy to get uh, this kind of knowledge through um, networking with people and talking to people and just getting that information firsthand because a lot of this information tends to be tacit, tends to be sticky. You know, just reading like documentation on it, it's not uh, going to stick as quickly as with you than talking to a professional who has already done it before and even better if they created like the framework in the first place. So that's one industry knowledge. And the last one is collaboration opportunities that you never knew existed. I think a lot of us are not just looking at like, oh, I'm going to just going to be a full time engineer my whole life. You're often doing site gigs like you're often doing like other collaborative uh, opportunities. You know, oftentimes, yeah, I admit like it is with sort of a general if you're like, let's say you're kind of looking for a job now. OK, I'll have this site gig project to put in my portfolio, for example, or uh, while I am doing this current full time job, I want this. Uh, to do like this other collaboration to be able to broker opportunities in my company in the next. So with networking, that's what you can get too. 
And that is basically my spiel as to why networking is also important to um, uh, techies as much as security is also important. So um, I'm going to be upfront uh, why techies might struggle more with uh, networking than um, I guess other folks outside in the industry. I've heard this comment a lot, and um, these are general, genuine, vulnerable uh, comments that people come to me, and you know they've already taken that step, join the tech community, but oftentimes they'll say that, but I'm an introvert. That's why. That's why I became an engineer. Like I didn't think that, like you know, I would have to step out of that comfort zone. And this is a perfectly valid um, um, and concern. Um, I think even research has shown that, like in our field, we tend to have uh, more higher levels of introversion than uh, other fields, and that's perfectly normal because with introversion comes like the skills to like deep focus, focus on like a single thing, get rid of all social uh, distractions and just like really solve that problem. Uh, we're also conditioned to be more comfortable working in structured smaller groups because that's our work environment, right? Uh, we're usually working in lean, small, agile teams. So when it comes to like, larger settings, you know, we kind of like feel that kind of social anxiety, that kind of like a social burnout as well. The engineering and the networking mindset kind of looks like different things as a whole too. With uh, engineering, we're trained to seek very precise solutions. We're trained to problem solve. We're given a clear objective. We're given a clear ticket, right? Then it's just like, yeah, solve this uh, ticket, push this feature. But like with networking, there is usually no tangible outcome. It tends to be quite ambiguous. It tends to be quite uncertain. And oftentimes, we feel kind of lost in that process. So I guess in view of this, my goal is one, I want to really distill this scary word of networking down into a very simple strategy um, that I personally was looking back at my journey since joining uh, Women Devs and then coming to be the partnership suite. Like, what are some things that I've kind of like gone back on when, you know, I start feeling a burnout? Like, yeah, I do feel that burnout. I do feel like that social anxiety. But what are the things that have continued to keep me grounded? Uh, you know, even today, like, I was dreading coming here, not gonna lie, I was just like, I just want to, like, continue sitting in front of my computer, like, that's much easier, you know, um, but, you know, what are these frameworks and mindsets that I practice to constantly keep me showing up? The next one is I want to basically do an inner join on uh, engineering and the network mindset. Um, this is this might seem forced for a little bit. I was just relooking at my slides. I was like, okay, I tried it hard, but bear with me. But basically, there are a lot of parallels between the two. And um, if I had more time, I would even go forth to show how like uh, the networking mindset almost is also incredibly beneficial as you push through the uh, your career in engineering. Um, but just today, I'll just use simple analogies just to open y'all to the concept. So. The first thing that I want you, if this, if this is the only thing that you take away from like this session, is to have an agendaless mindset when it comes to meeting people, when it comes to networking. I think this is um, really important and very difficult to undo for uh, people with the engineering mindset because you know you always come in, you know you have that ticket, you have that goal, and I have to do this. That's an agenda. You know, you come in with every stand up. It's like, what's the agenda? What did you do? What did you not do? Right? You're stressed, but. The thing is, if you come in with like an agenda with like uh, meeting people, you're always like, today I want to find a new job. I want to meet a recruiter. And then this year, like, okay, I'm going to find a recruiter. I only talk to a recruiter. You're going to come up as pretty desperate. That's one. That's two. I think like with uh, human interaction, people are looking for authenticity. People are looking for genuine uh, connections. So, it's very easy to identify and be skeptical when people come in with an agenda. So I really want to advocate from, uh, for an agendaless mindset. And I have a really good example of this because I was like, I think it was, I forgot what event it was. But I had this really sweet girl who came up to me. I was, okay, today I'm not wearing it, but I'm wearing a Hexagon shirt. I am not from Hexagon before, okay, I was just one of the judges. But I was wearing a Google Cloud t-shirt. And uh, this sweet girl came up to me and she was like, I'm an intern. I'm currently uh, studying at XYZ University. My game plan is first year, I need to intern at a main company. Second year, I need to intern at a startup. And third year, I need to do like an SME or something. Then when I graduate, I'll be able to like have a full portfolio. And I was like, so which year are you in? I'm in my first year. So I'm looking for a main company. And I saw that you're wearing your Google shirt. 
do you have internships for me? And I was like, wow. The thing is, like, she didn't mean any harm. And it, if you think about it, yeah, that, that seems like a logical um, like way of thinking. But she obviously had an agenda coming into the event, right? She was not here to just meet people. She was here to like, I'm just here to find my internship. But think about all the other opportunities that she could have lost through this exchange if that was the only one agenda that she was looking for. Um, you know, like for me at that point, I was looking for interns for my existing organization. I was also on behalf of like other organizations looking for people who are keen on starting like volunteer side projects, looking for people to, you know, come in volunteer for hackathons and stuff like that. I had a lot of things that I could offer on the table for her that could have allowed her to gain opportunities to eventually get that internship um, like in one of the main companies, Google, if you want. Like, honestly, I was there even at Google like maybe like two weeks later. So could have given her the referral in some way, but you know, she, she, she really shut up the opportunity the moment I was like, oh no, I'm just wearing this shirt because like I got it from like completing like the life. She's like, okay, and then she left. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't think she meant it, but I think, like, you know, especially as a first year student, there is also the social pressures to do that. And I think, like, um, I, I feel like when I was um, a first year student in my college then, and I see everybody fighting for those opportunities, I feel so much pressure too. And I end up, like, going back to, like, the thing I know best the engineering mindset. What's my agenda here? But no, I would say that, like, go and meet people with no agenda at all. You're only agenda you're not looking for specific people to talk to too many times like people would like try to find a recruiter in a room try to find like the principal engineer from the thing. but no, no i'm just kidding <laughs> no people will, like find specific people and then just like gun in on them but missing out on all the other people in the room a lot of my recruiter friends for example they're just a lot of them are general recruiters too but they the recruiter network is vast, by the way. Like, they know each other, they'll refer and stuff like that. Even if they're not representing the company that you're looking for, you're going to know. And this is Singapore, okay? This is not the stage or whatever. A very small community. So, and I'm not saying, like, okay, then only look for the recruiters. You never know. Somebody may have interned in a company, like, years ago that you're looking for or somewhere or another. Opportunities are vast and for you to create. But these connections are for you to forge first. So don't look for specific people to talk to. Don't look for specific things that you're getting out of the conversation. Just go in with the expectation of learning more about first yourself than the other person. And uh, yeah, it, basically learning about yourself in exchange for learning more about the other person. And then later, the opportunities, it's for you to craft later. OK, so now that we've set this uh, agendaless mindset, I know there's the stress of networking, right? Like, I really need to find a job. I really need to find a first year internship so that I could get the main one. That's right. Oh, but remember, there's no agenda. So don't be so hard on yourself. Um, there are no goals here. You're just here to get to know people, like all these friendly people in this community here, um, to understand yourself better, to open yourself to new experiences if they happen to knock the door. Um, also remember that this is an iterative self-discovery process just because you leave this room not getting like a, even a bleep of an internship offer doesn't mean you failed you know you could have walked off with like somebody who was in a similar boot camp that you were for example and maybe this other person's like hey did you actually like check out the type of career event that women that was doing uh on 25th june um and then maybe you go there and then you get the opportunity that kind of thing so with the no the agendaless mindset I hope that takes pressure off you, especially for people who identify with that kind of social anxiety, that kind of social burnout. Go in, no agenda. Okay, with that, okay, that's a Michael point. Oh, there was a typo. Okay, I typed this very fast. But the core of networking, so I said that I was going to simplify the essence and the iterative process of networking in one simple thing. It's actually divergent and convergent thinking. So divergent and convergent thinking, uh, it's a framework to understand how uh, people uh, come together, create choices, create ideas, and then after that kind of funnel them down into one singular uh, or a few singular uh, thoughts and ideas. Um, this might look kind of like abstract, but you might see this in conversation patterns. Conversations occur naturally in uh, um, networking conversations, right? So you can see how like, 
you know, you diverge from like one point, like say like, oh, oh, drink water, okay? That could be a conversation point. Have you guys drank your water? <laughs> but anyways, like, yeah, we you start from like a single point of like, hello, like my name's Natasha, your name is? Oh, her name is Jane, okay. I heard that you just came out of the GA bootcamp. Yeah, I didn't know, oh no, but it's okay. Yeah, but basically this is like a starting point of that divergence. That's when we can start diverging to, oh, a GA bootcamp, I could ask, what is that? Uh, tell me more about it. Or I could say that like, oh, I've heard of like uh, other people in the bootcamp as well. You want to link up. So that's how you slowly start from a singular point of like, hey, like GA bootcamp, diverge that into a wider storytelling. As you continue, then your interests start converging like, hey, actually, I didn't know that you were from this school. I'm from this school as well, converge. New stories emerge, converge. That's how a natural conversation pattern starts and that's divergent and convergent linking. You might also see this for those who have experienced uh, Scrum facilitation or some form of uh, ideation process uh, with Scrum facilitators. You know, they're um, usually trying to facilitate these kinds of conversations and divergent and convergent thinking in large groups. First, we brainstorm. Okay, here we have like a problem. We're trying to brainstorm for like features that's gonna be solutions to this problem. Okay, five minutes. Take it. Take your time to think. Then we, after that, each one of you share your uh, solutions. Then we come back. Do maybe scrum poker or something. Vote on which one you think like it's a good idea. Then you converge into like, okay, so what is the feature we're gonna build from here? That uh, also this divergent and convergent thinking comes up in scrum facilitation as well. So you can start seeing it playing out in a lot of like um, interactive settings. The last one I'm gonna propose, okay, bear with me here. It kind of looks like, <laughs> it kind of looks like, okay, who, who, who can tell what this looks like? Oh my God, nobody. Am I that old in the AI field? Okay, I know it's not like very hot in AI right now. Nobody, you're taking a picture, do you know? Okay, it's again model guy. It's is again network, generative adversarial uh, network. Okay, it's okay if you don't know. I know this is quite relatively old concept in AI now, okay? Because all of you, if you're transformers and whatever. Okay, this was my era. Okay, so basically <laughs> with a GAN model, you have two neural networks that are fighting against each other. That's why adversarial, right? What they're fighting against each other is quite interesting. With the generator here, you have like uh, noise input coming in, raw data. Generator takes that data, um, kind of simplifies it down into very simple um, like patterns and just generates a whole bunch of synthetic data. So over here, the discriminator. The discriminator is another neural network that basically uh, is trying to determine, is this real or synthetic data? So it's being fed both like um, data from the generator as well as data um, that's um, real training data. So basically it keeps fighting until like the discriminator 50-50 can't tell. I don't know whether it's like fake or real. Then the generator wins. And you basically, you know, you get like uh, something that can generate uh, text, images, whatever that's synthetic, but very close to the real deal. Nobody knew this, seriously? Okay. Um, Y'all get the concept, right? Because I'm gonna use this analogy moving forward. But anyways, bear with me. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot back. Uh, now that I've hopefully drawn some kind of like um, relation between convergence and divergence, I tried very hard here, but actually it looks very similar. Um, but basically over here, you see a divergence. You put in raw input, you have like your simplified uh, patterns in that data, and then it diverges from there, right? Just generate a whole bunch of synthetic data. There's no judgment in that point of like, what's real, what's wrong, I just generate. Discriminator here converges, com converges. It's basically trying to determine what's real and fake, and in this case, it's um, e doing a lot of evaluation of what's high quality data and what's low quality data. So that's the analogy I'm drawing here. Here, I want to propose that the core of networking and the ability to you know, have that convergence and divergence when you talk to people, when you interact with people, is rooted in self-discovery. And this self-discovery is basically how you find your own generator and discriminator layers. So I want to take 
all of you through this exercise that I actually started uh, performing. I wouldn't say performing, but like subconsciously thinking to myself, especially uh, the moment um, I left Singapore, went to the States and realized that the labels I had attached myself to in Singapore, nobody cares about them in the States. For example, um, I think a common way of introducing yourselves to each other, I, I still hear this, is like, oh, oh I, I was from uh, XYZ JC, I was from XYZ Polytechnic. No, seriously, like I am talking to 45 year, year olds and they're telling me, oh, I used to be from this JC and this was my experience. I'm like, uh, okay, you're 45. But <laughs> yeah, why are you thinking about it? Was that your peak? But anyways, <laughs> um, what I learned was that, say, these JCs, these experiences, this extracurriculars that I had in Singapore, if I go to the United States and I tell them, who the hell were they, right? Nobody understood. I had to basically rebuild and rebrand myself. So how was I going to introduce myself? That's where I started thinking about the concept of limited labels versus expansive labels. Limited labels are labels that you use in yourself that link back to an organization. These, this could sound like, I am a software engineer at Google. If I remove Google, if I got retrenched by Google today, you have no more of that label. That's why it's limited. It also limits you in scope. It limits you to that job description. I'm not saying by limit, I, I couldn't find a synonym for this with a sound of good luck, but like, it's, it's, it's also a good thing and I will show you why later. But basically, it's often temporal. It's dependent on time and space. Just like I was in XYZ uh, JC Polytechnic. It's only for those few years of your life. I was in XYZ company as a software engineer. Those few years of your life. Um, so we're really looking at roles, titles, Hello. <laughs> okay. Hello. Okay. We're li really looking at roles and titles here. And I think off the top of your head, I want you to like subconsciously think about like, when I go ahead and introduce myself to someone new, what are the limited labels that I use? Like even now, just now when I was hanging out with y'all, like uh, you introduce them by their limited labels. There are students who just graduated from the GA bootcamp. That's a limited label that, okay, contextualizes things for me, so it helps. And that's something that stuck with you when they introduce themselves to you. So limited labels, that's a very common way of introducing. But I had to learn what expansive labels were in the States. These are unaffiliated organizations and can be a common denominator across various uh, labels that you might have. For example, you know, if you're, you just have like an int overarching interest in tech, it's going to explain why you're a software engineer at Google. It's going to explain why you're in a volunteer tech organization. It's a common denominator. It's often unchanging. I like you're you're not going to like okay, for for certain instances, I guess. But today you like tech. Tomorrow you're not going to immediately fall out of love of it. So it's often unchanging, and it's a huge breadth of things. It could be your knowledge, your interests, your values, beliefs, skills, experiences. These are things that characterize you as an individual without any affiliation to a temporal organization. So with this, I want to bring the GAN model back because I'm trying very hard. <laughs> and uh, I hope this works. But I think it's like what I saw was that with limited labels, they tend to work very well as a discriminator. Uh, and um, they work very well in terms of like defining the different layers where you use these labels to evaluate this information coming at me, these ideas that I'm generating. Is it relevant to the limited label that I'm uh, using now? For example, uh, uh, me, me talking to Melody right now. Oh, okay, like later on we realize, oh wait, you, you're in Jitter Dev SG. I'm in Women Dev SG. Those are all limited labels. But I realized with that, it's very easy to use this to converge and like, maybe we could do a co-event together. You know, that's kind of how it converges. With expansive labels, it helps a lot in generating ideas. Um, it helps a lot in being the generator in this case, um, because we're talking about experiences that you could go on and on and storytell. You're talking about skills and stuff like that that people can easily relate to. Like, I'm not from Google, but I can relate to your experience as a software engineer, because software engineer by itself is, to me, an expensive label. So that's kind of like how I see it. So using myself as an example, uh, and I hope that this allows you to contextualize it. Um, I a software engineer, like I haven't made up my mind whether it's a limited label, sorry, like limited label, expensive label, I changed my mind a lot of me. But 
I haven't decided if it's a limited label, software engineer, like your trade, your main skill, but I usually like to introduce myself first. Like uh, by trade, I am a software engineer. Um, but in terms of like really diving deep down, what does that mean? My skills, which are my non-labels, like my experience like working in zero to one products, products is from scratch, my experience in having had the ability to work on design systems so I know how UX UI, UX UI works. You know, like I see that as an expensive label because those are unique experiences that I have. Um, that's kind of how I differentiated it, but this one is kind of like, I, I don't really know. Um, I work in the government sector for now. I, I could leave tomorrow. That's the thing. So you see how like it's uh, a change, it can change. I'm a women that's actually partnerships lead as of now. And my university, uh, UCLA, Boston University, like these are things that happened in the past, but only for that limited period of time. So these are my limited labels. My expensive labels, um, so my values, for example, I will always be somebody who's curious. I will always be somebody who believes in intrinsic goodness and I just like, I uh, want to see what my value to community is. Uh, interest, I love bridging tech and non-tech folks. Um, I love being in the animal welfare space and I blame the differently able. Uh, and these, you know, can lead to a lot of conversations about my experiences or how I used to have a startup because I really wanted to see what's the functional aspects of tech versus the technical aspects of tech. <laughs> uh, volunteer experiences, you know, I'm, I'm a critical care foster with SPCA, blah, blah, blah. I got to talk about that super expensive. So that's me using me as an example. I want you to take the next few minutes and remember that this is an iterative process, but you have to start somewhere. And with every interaction that you have with individuals, with every experience that you have, you're gonna keep thinking about these labels that you have. But what are your limited and expensive labels? And as you mull on this question, um, before we're gonna break off into networking, I guess after everything ends, uh, I, I want this to guide you like as you introduce yourself to people and then work on that experience. So how might a networking conversation look like with this understanding? This is a real conversation that happened, simplified but real. So a convo might go, so I was talking, when I first met uh, my friend, she later I found out was a recruiter. Um, I think we just kind of got together in a barbecue or something. And then uh, I didn't go in and immediately tell her, I'm a software engineer in the government sector, and uh, currently I am uh, in women that's like, oh, no, I didn't introduce myself to that. Like, I was talking to her like, oh, hey, like, yeah, I actually love, like, you know, being in the field of raising awareness on tech and the realities of being in the tech industry. I think that the industry uh, tends to be really exclusive in media, blah, blah, blah. Notice that throughout this introduction, I didn't use um, labels, and I put myself through the practice of how do I introduce myself without uh, limited labels. That's why I could achieve this sentence. She replied in a you know, condensed way here. I'm not a techie, but I've always wanted to learn more about tech so that I can do my job better. So, you know, opening this, it's really easy for that to start generating a slew of conversations and eventually we arrive at like, yeah, you know, did you see the recent tech layoffs? Like, oh, this and this and that and that. Like, actually, you know, I'm trying to hire, I'm like, who are you trying to hire for? And that, that's where we started using our limited labels, only towards the end of the conversation to discriminate, where I reveal I'm actually a partnership suite in Women Devs SG, and I've always wanted to do an event uh, when it comes to uh, connecting volunteers to jobs. And she was like, wait, I'm actually a tech recruiter, and I'm looking for more techies to fill jobs because I'm struggling. So it actually eventually converged after a few conversations, of course, which I will show later that it's iterative, let's do a tech recruitment event. It's kind of like how the whole process went, like from generating and diverging on like different things using your expensive labels, and then like converging on the things using your limited labels. So um, I, okay, probably it's a weird segue, but I wanted to use that example to also talk about how to manage that social burnout and anxiety that we might all feel, especially, I think we're all like the pandemic to non-pandemic, not that the pandemic has ended, but like <laughs> the word that era. And I think I like, definitely felt that transition. So I wanted to give a few tips to reassure people. So one, 
to remember that not just you, the participant is also a generator and a discriminator. They need space to talk to as much as you. So don't feel the constant need to talk and fill in silence all the time. You don't have to. That's going to like lead you to not just having a dry mouth, but being incredibly tired from generating an idea. Just imagine like a like a model like running for hours on end, like and you're super excited, whatever. Uh, so you don't have to be a wine constantly generating generating ideas and talking. As a matter of fact, active listening is a really, really good trait to have. And that by itself is a trait that people will remember you for. Everybody wants to be listened to. Okay? Like everybody wants attention. And the, if you give people this attention, they will remember you for it. They will want to come back to you for it. So asking good questions, I could expand on this, but basically in general, just know that the moment you feel like, I feel like I don't want to catch up anymore, ask good questions. Leverage on like some things that they might talk about and prompt them to give you give you more generated uh, ideas. Use micro gestures to show that you're engaged. It doesn't have to be asking questions all the time because that's also pretty tiring. Look at them in the eye and just like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that you can do to be engaged in a conversation to encourage the other person to generate and also like uh, diverge where they uh, uh, converge when you want to. So it's a great way to manage idea generation burnout. Keep reminding yourself you don't have to keep talking, you don't have to keep generating. Your role actually later on as you engage in more conversation is to facilitate and you want the other person to share more. So what you're trying to do, keep the, com the divergence convergence cycle going, but don't do it at the expense of yourself. So the entire process is not one singular conversation. It's an iterative and dynamic process from the time where you start meeting someone all the way to the end of time, all the way until you decide to ghost that person up to you. But um, it's not measured by the length of a singular conversation. What this also means is that you can pause any time and return to that conversation. What this could look like is, OK, maybe you're talking, talking, and at some point you're like, oh, I'm really running out of time. I'm supposed to leave this event. But like, if I lose this event, I lose talking to this person who might be a recruiter, if I lose this job, it's not going to happen. It's OK. You can always say, I, I feel like there's potential in this collaboration, and I really, really want to continue uh, talking to you, but I need to go back and do some research because I want to like fuel these ideas more. Let's reach out with, uh, to, uh, I want to reach out to you with more ideas on LinkedIn. Can I send you like a message? Can we connect? You can pause over here, right over here, and then come back. Next coffee chat, next LinkedIn conversation. Perfectly fine. Conversation still goes on. You can also pause in the middle of generating big ideas and say, I love you sharing these ideas. But in your head, you're like, I'm so burnt out right now. I'm so like uh, oversensitized about the noises happening around me. Just tell the person, I would love to continue this in a private setting because I want to hear you better. Can I have your contact if you get a little coffee for later? See, the process goes on. Moral of the story, there is no end to networking. It's iterative. Don't put pressure on yourself. When you do start to identify like um, signs of burnout, um, and this looks different for everyone, I could have a separate like session on this, but really, you can always always remember you can pause and return. Even if you just just meet a person, I've done this a lot of time. Like literally, I'm rushing out. I'm like I'm done with the event, and they're like, No, like can I talk to you? But like, no, but I really need to go. No, let's connect on LinkedIn. But be sure to send me a message and tell me who you are. Then we picked up right uh, right out uh, with a coffee chat, like, you know, even a month later if you want. Perfectly fine. So I guess that ends it. I only have a very short session, but because it's like my first time talking about this topic, um, yeah, it was really hard to condense a lot of that. But I want to tell you how, like, this process actually worked really well for me because this is really happening. Uh, and it happened from a series of conversion and divergent co conversations that I had with then somebody I completely didn't know. I probably wouldn't talk to if I used like an agenda-based mindset that I only want to talk to techies. So it's not a techie. Um, you know, then later we converge and diverge, and we finally have this kind of like a strange event, actually, because um, our approach to it was like, you know, people don't know the perspective of recruiters and the big white world that is uh, the recruiting world. You have general recruiters, you have hiring managers, you have even like engineers within teams who are leads with the teams that really don't know the HR policies to hire, but they want to hire so many different people. But how come like we as like um, techies are so like, I need to get my resume, put it out, apply, lead code, blah, blah, blah. And, like, ah, I don't want me. Let me stop there. 
But what about considering what's happening on the recruiter side? And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so this is the Instagram uh, link to Women of SG, uh, which contains more links to our meetup group uh, and this event. So uh, please feel free to join if you want. But really, like, even though this is a shameless plug, I just really wanted to show you like how this manifested into something, something that nobody would have ever thought about because like the essence of creating these experiences is within your practice of that kind of divergent and convergent thinking. It all lies within you. You can do this with, just close your eyes and point a single person in a room, you'll be able to create some kind of experience with them. So again, no agenda, no rush, take it easy. And yeah, that was it, thank you.